Shalom. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Cornerstone. Let's pray before we get into our time of worship. Father, we ask you, Lord God, that you would meet us, Lord, tonight. Father, wherever we might be, God, uh, spiritually, physically, God, wherever we're at, Lord. I know many of us are apart from each other, Lord, and God, some of us feel alone and isolated, God, and so, Father, I pray, God, that your spirit would fall upon your church, Lord, wherever they may be. We love you, Father. We thank you. We ask you, Lord, to meet us, Lord, where we're at. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father, we love you so much, God. We thank you, Lord. Jesus, we love you for what you've done for us. Speak to your people now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good evening, church. I want to welcome you to our uh, Sunday evening studies on the book of Psalms and uh, currently in Psalm 119. And uh, we're almost finished with Psalm 119. We have, after tonight, we'll have two more weeks, so, and then we'll move right into Proverbs. But let's go ahead and open up with prayer. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and grace in our life, God. We thank you that we're your children. We thank you that you watch over us, you protect us. God, we thank you that, um, again, that uh, your spirit leads and guides us into all truth, Lord. And we do pray that we, that everybody in the church family and also those watching are uh, in good health, Lord, we pray you continue to cover all of us, Lord, and our families, Lord, our loved ones. God, we continue to pray, God, for our leaders uh, all over the world, God, and uh, especially in regards to, to this pandemic, God, that uh, you'd give them wisdom and discernment, God. That, Father, you show them what needs to be done, God, and that, that Lord, you would just uh, have your way and that, God, you would uh, bring this pandemic to an end, God. And so, Lord, we thank you. We pray for those who are sick, that you would touch them, you'd heal them, Lord. Uh, We pray for those who have maybe lost loved ones, God, that you have, that you would give them the comfort that only you could give, God. So, Lord, we look to you now, and um, may your spirit have full control of of this time and, and of our hearts, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, we're going to be looking at verses 161 through 168. And the title this evening is Blessed are the Stable. In other words, being a balanced Christian, there are blessings in being a balanced Christian that we're not, you know, off in one way or, you know, too much in another. And and we need to find that balance. And that balance comes through the word of God. 
And in our study tonight, um, that's what the psalmist is going to show us. Obedience seems to be the subject that we looked at last in, in, Psalm, uh, in verses 153 through 160. And the psalmist mentions it in, Psalm, in verse 158, but in a negative way. He, you know, he mentioned that they don't, they don't keep your word. And the subject of obedience then carries over into our verses tonight, 161 through 168. The psalmist knows that obedience is not an option. And we need to understand that. And we need to believe it. We need to know it, that, that obedience to God and his word is not an option. And I think sometimes, you know, we'll, we can read the scriptures or, and look at certain things that God says and go, well, you know, I don't really think he means it the way. It, well, you know what? You, you need to know and you need to find out. You need to you know, know that, that we don't have the luxury of, pick, of picking and choosing the, the scriptures that, that we agree with and that we like. And the psalmist knows that it's obedience, that obedience is the sign of true discipleship. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And it's the only good reason that he can have, that is the, the individual, the believer, it's the only reason that he can have uh, uh, ask for God for help from him. You know, is that the uh, only good reason he can have, you know, uh, for God to help him because, you know, he's obedient and he's following the Lord in, in obedience. Last week, the psalmist showed us some, some of the things that he learned from verses 153 through 160. The psalmist learned that God was merciful, 156. He learned that God's word is true in verse 160. And now we pick up where we left off with verse 61. So let's see what it has to say. And the psalmist begins... Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. He says, powerful people are harassing me for no reason. But he says, my heart trembles only at your word. And the psalmist here lets us know how discouraged he was because he was afraid of man. He said, princes, that is powerful people. He says, they're persecuting me for no reason. And it's normal for even the best of men, all right, to be persecuted. We are not immune. Nobody is immune from persecution. But it makes it worse if it's powerful people that are doing the, that are doing the persecution because they seem to have the ability and, and they seem to know the right people and they can do it and make it look like it's the right thing to do. But but he faithfully, the psalmist faithfully stayed the course, even under the trying circumstances, because you see, he feared God more than he feared man. He said, my heart stands in awe of your word. The word awe means respect. It means reverence. It means fear. And he says, I am determined to please you, Lord. And I'm determined to stay with you no matter how unhappy people are with me. You see, he's not a man pleaser. And to every Christian who stands in awe, that is, who has reverence and fear and respect for, for God's word, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, the Lord will, <clears throat> will, will have favor on them. And so uh, it's, it's who, who stands in awe of its authority and its warnings. None of man's power or anger scares them. And if I'm right with God, I fear no man. And we need to obey God rather than men. And we need to make sure that we have God's approval in whatever we do, even though everybody else frowns on us. If your heart loves God and it loves his and you love his word, your heart loves his word. When you're ready for the trials that come for persecution, you'll be on solid ground. You'll be balanced. You won't be swayed to and fro when those trials come. Then verse 162, the psalmist says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. The psalmist here tells us how much pleasure he had in God's word. He rejoiced in it. He rejoiced that God opened his mind to help him see it and understand it. He rejoiced that Israel was blessed with that light when other nations were in darkness. He was blessed that he was allowed to understand the word of God and had experienced his power. The psalmist here got so much pleasure from reading God's word, from hearing it and meditating on it, and and that everything he found in it, he agreed with. 
First of all, he said his heart stood in awe of God's word. And here he says that he rejoiced in God's word. The more awe that we have for God's word, I really believe the more that we're going to find joy in it. We'll love it. He just said in verse 161 that his heart stood in awe of his word. And yet, notice, here he says he rejoiced in it. He awed in God's word. He rejoiced in it. The more reverence, respect, and fear that we have for the word of God, the more joy we're going to find in it. And again, we need to ask ourselves, how much pleasure do I get out of God's word? Do I read it because I, I, it's a duty? Or, or I feel that, uh, grudgingly that I have to read the word? There's not much joy in that. You know, do you, do you get joy out of it like somebody that might find a valuable treasure? Do you find a lot of pleasure in reading God's word? Again, it's like, is it like finding a treasure to you? Because the promises of, of God in the Bible, they are better than money in the bank. Or, or any kind of wealth that a person might have because, you see, banks are unstable. But God's promises will never lose their value and nobody can take them from us. Nobody can take God's promises from us. Then he goes on to say in, in verse 163, he says, I hate and abhor lying, but I love your way. I hate all faults, what he says, but I love your word. I love your instructions. And the two main feelings that seem to be going on in his heart is love and hate. Love and hate. If we love and hate the right things, then everything else is going to be okay. And here the psalmist has them in the right order. He had an unchanging hatred for sin. We must hate the things that God hates. He couldn't stand to even think about sin. He says, I hate in a bore line, which is probably how he felt about all sin. Because when we sin, we deal treacherously and we deal deceitfully with man and God. And we deceive ourselves. Hypocrisy is lying. False doctrine is lying. Unfaithfulness is lying. Lying in business, lying in conversation, it's a sin. It's a sin that every good man hates. Because of the seven things that the Lord hates, one is a lying tongue. It's second on the list. And another is a false witness that tells lies in Proverbs 6.16. And so, again, I mean, think about it. Don't you hate being lied to? I would probably think that everybody does. But we should hate it even more. What we should hate even more is lying to others. Because when somebody lies to us, we're only offended by a man. But when we lie to other people, we offend man and God. The psalmist had a deep love for God's word, a deep love, respect, and reverence. He says, I love your law. He says, that's why I hate lying. Because lying is contrary to the whole word of God. And the reason why he loved the law of God was because of the truth of, of God's word. He says in Psalm 97, 10, you who love the Lord hate evil. You who love the Lord hate evil. You see, how can you love evil? How can you enjoy evil and say you love the Lord? When the psalmist says you who love the Lord hate evil. The more we see the goodness of truth, the more we're going to see the ugliness of lies. Lying is really terrible. And when we lie, we have to keep on lying in order to cover each lie that we tell. And it's really harder to, to tell a lie uh, than it is to tell a truth because we have to keep covering that lie. Verse 164. He says, seven times a day, I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Lord, I will praise you seven times a day because I your word, all, all of your word is just. The psalmist, you know, the psalmist made a lot of complaints throughout this psalm. But they didn't cause him to stop praising the Lord. And also, the things that he complained about, they didn't cause him to have a bad attitude. All right, he didn't cause him to have a bad attitude. No matter what condition a child of God is in, he really doesn't have any reason not to. To praise the Lord. How often did the psalmist praise God? He said seven times a day. Now, not just every day, not just once a day, but seven times a day. 
You know, a lot of times we think once a day is good enough. Or, or once or twice a day. And again, er, 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 all situations are different. Maybe that day, that's, that's all we could do. And you know what? God honors it. But the psalmist would praise God seven times a day at least. Praising God, really, it, it's a duty to us. And we should do it a lot. We should praise God at every meal. We should praise God on all occasions. Uh, we should, you know, uh, praise God for special needs. And, and you know, in, in everything, give thanks. It says in First Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, again, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It says in everything, not for everything. All right. Again, we you know don't want to sound like like masochists or say to say, oh yeah, we I'm glad. Oh, this feels so good. And it, you know, it's in in the situation because in it, my God is in it, and God's going to help me to deal with it. And I'm going to find something that, that God's going to show me in this situation. The devoted Jewish worshiper would praise God and pray three times a day, but the psalmist went beyond that, and he worshiped God seven times a day. So the phrase means often and many times. Seven is not the magic number. You know, again, it's not about number, but it, it, it's pointing to, to, to often. It means I should praise the Lord often. I should praise him many times more than what's expected. And when you think about it, can we ever praise God too much? Never. The legalist would set a goal. And he'd be proud to say, oh, yeah, I, you know, I did it seven times a day. But, you know, he would set a goal and be proud that he preached it. The spirit-filled believer doesn't set any goal, but goes beyond any goal that might be set. Just like prayer, it can bring peace to our hearts. So can praise. Why? Because we're focusing on the Lord. We're not asking for anything. We are totally absorbed in our praise of God and our praise to him. And that has ways of making our problems look a lot smaller and it helps to make the future look a lot brighter. But you know what? Praise also helps us to keep it together. When we feel like we're ready to fall apart and things are tearing us apart, praise helps to keep us together in our Christian walk and to not stumble or cause others to stumble. The praising and worshiping believer is a balanced believer they're walking on a level path even when the enemy is is pushing at them and digging pits and and setting up obstacles and roadblocks and we should praise god as often as we can as many times as we can because we can never praise god too much praise can never be worn out there's never a bad time to praise him we should never get tired of our devotion to him it should be continual and it should be repeated What did the psalmist praise God for? He said his righteous judgments. We need to praise God for his instruction, which they're all good. They're all just. Praise him for his promises. Praise him for his warnings. And and to praise him for what he does in providence. That is, you know, his hand upon our life, the things that he brings into our life. We are to praise God even for our afflictions. Why? Because we grow in them. If we grow in character because of our afflictions, and we should, it's because through God's grace is that we do. And we'll grow in God's grace if we have the right attitude towards our difficulties, our afflictions. James said in chapter 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And, and that's the right attitude towards trial. It's counting it all joy. It's not, you know, grabbing on and, and, and holding on and, and white knuckles, you know, and just grinning and bearing it and biting the bullet. No, it's counting it all joy because God is moving. God is doing something. First Peter, he says in chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, notice, after you have suffered a while perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Verse 165, the psalmist goes on to say, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. This is one of my favorite verses in Psalm 119. It's powerful, and it's one that we need to to highlight and to remember. The psalmist says here, He learned that personal peace comes from personal obedience. 
The word peace in the Hebrew is shalom and salvation, and the two go together. In salvation, there's peace, and they're closely connected. Shalom is a broad, loving word for the good that comes to somebody that God favors. It has to do with personal well-being in all areas that has anything to do with you. Spiritually, it speaks of peace with God through the works of Jesus Christ. Materially, it can mean prosperity. Personally, it has to do with a peaceful state of mind that comes from putting all of your hope in God's word. Make sure that you notice that the verse doesn't promise you peace if you perfectly keep or obey God's laws, because we can't. Remember in Galatians, we learned that you can't keep the law perfectly. There's a conflict between the flesh and the spirit. And there's times that we don't always do the things that that we know we're to do. But peace is promised to those who love God's law. And I would think that the people who love God's law love it because by reading and obeying it, they found out that God is merciful. And also, if you love God, then you're going to love his word and you're going to obey it. The psalmist also learned that the obedient are secure. Where else can we find security in this life? Our only real security is in God. There's no security in anything else or anybody else in this life except in loving and living by the abiding and infallible eternal word of God. Jesus said in John 15, 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He said in John 15, 4 through 6, I am the vine, Jesus said. You are the branches. He who abides. The word abide means to remain or to stay. He says, whoever abides in me, remains in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, that is, remain in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. You see, he says, unless, he says, if anyone does not remain in me, stay in me. He's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them in the fire and they're burned. There's no security apart from Jesus Christ. People this evening, this, especially this evening, man, they want peace of mind so badly. And the psalmist here gives us clear cut instructions on how to get that peace. If we love God and we obey his word, we will have great peace. You know, the, the times that I, that I have in, in my life as a Christian, that I found most uncomfortable or, or, or you know, don't feel it is, is when I haven't obeyed God. When I know that I, I've sinned and, you know, maybe I'm waiting to, to, Say I'm sorry to somebody and, and you know, I'm miserable until I do. I'm uncomfortable until I do. I'm convicted until I do. And so, again, um, we have great peace, uh, you know, when, when our sins are forgiven and, and my conscience is clear and, I, and I'm living right for God. Again, in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, You will keep him in per- perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The word stay means to lean upon or take hold of. You see, we can't dodge all the conflict and chaos that's in the world around us. We're not immune to it. It's not going to pass us by. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But then he gave us the encouragement, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. You know, we can know perfect peace even when the world is in turmoil like it is right now. When we're devoted to God, our whole attitude is rock steady, stable. Because it's supported by God's unchanging love and by his mighty power. And because we're we're supported by that unchanging love and by his mighty power, we're not shaken. We're not shaken by this chaos all around us. We're living in a world right now that's unstable. I mean, it's always been unstable. Right now, it's, in my lifetime, it's, it seems to be more unstable than it's ever been. It's being shaken right now. This world is being shaken right now. And, you know, it, it, and it's like a, a fruit tree. 
that, that when it's shaken, if you're not strongly attached to the branches, you're going to fall off before it's time. And the fruit is not going to be any good. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 12, 28, since we are receiving a kingdom, notice, which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now this world is being shaken, but we are going to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And those people that receive that kingdom are not to be people that can be shaken. As a result of the shaking world right now, it is falling apart. Many people are falling apart. The world is falling apart right now. But we, as God's people, shouldn't be falling apart. Only God's kingdom and only God's people are going to last. We're the only ones that are not going to be shaken. Those who follow Jesus Christ are part of an unshakable kingdom and they will survive the shaking. They will survive the strain and they will survive the fires. When we feel unsure about what happens here in this life, remember our future is built on a solid foundation that cannot be destroyed. Don't put your confidence in or hold on to what will be destroyed. Instead, build your life on the rock, Jesus Christ, and his unshakable, unsinkable kingdom. So if you want peace, keep your thoughts on and your trust in God. Because he's the only one who stands alone who stands above the pressures of daily life and gives us full assurance. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians 4, 8, and 9. He said, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Paul is saying, fix your thoughts on these things that he just mentioned. Those things that are just with things that are, poor, that, are, that, are, that are pure and of good report. Meditate on those things. Fix your minds on the thoughts of God. The things which you have learned, the things that you have received and heard and saw in me, Paul said, do these things. And notice what he says, the outcome, the God of peace will be with you. A peace that passes all human understanding, even in the midst of our shaken world. And, and, and know this for a fact and understand it. Your peace and your joy in Christ does not depend upon how other people are towards you. It doesn't depend upon other people's attitudes or the circumstances in your life. Nobody or no circumstance can take your joy from you unless you let them. Isaiah says in Isaiah 32, 17, the work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. This is the life of somebody whose life is led by this principle of their love for the word of God and who makes it their instructions and they are ruled by it. Their life is led by it. They're easygoing. They have a calmness about them. Nobody enjoys themselves more than they do. As Isaiah said in 32, 17, the work of righteousness is peace and it's assurance and it's not temporary. He says it's forever. It's a peace that the world cannot give and it's a peace that the world cannot take away. You know, we may be going through a terrible time right now. But you know what? You'd never know it because... They have a great, we have a great peace inside. Philippians 4, 7 again, Paul said, the peace of God which, which surpasses all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Now those who love this world, they don't have any real pleasure. I mean, what pleasure is there for those who don't know Christ right now in this world? What pleasure is there? They have no pleasure because right now it is failing their expectation. It's failing their expectation. It's not fulfilling their life. But those that love God's word, 
They have great peace. Why? Because it exceeds their expectation. And in God's word, they have a solid foundation. They have something to stand on that holds them steady in a shaking world. They're safe and they have a holy security. Nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall be a scandal or a trap or a stumbling block to them. All right, to get them caught up in guilt or grief. Nothing God allows in his providence. That is nothing that God allows in his will and purpose for our life will be, you know, an unshakable temptation. There's nothing that 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 we can't shake off. It won't be an unbearable affliction to us. But our love for the word of God will help us to keep our integrity and our calmness. And we will make the best of whatever comes our way. And we won't complain about anything that God does. Nothing will offend them or hurt them. Because you know what? Everything will work for their good. Again, Romans 8, 28. Even this pandemic, I know it sounds crazy, but you know what? God says all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So it will be pleasing to them and they will submit themselves to it. So be it, Lord. As as Job said, though the Lord slay me, I will serve him. Verse 166, the psalmist goes on and says, Lord, I hope for your salvation and I do your commandments. Lord, I long, I desire your salvation. I long for your salvation. Lord, I obey your word. Here the psalmist is teaching man's full responsibility. He says, first of all, to keep our eyes on the Lord. He says, Lord, I hope for your salvation. I have made your salvation my goal. I've made it my happiness. And it's your salvation, Lord, that keeps my head looking up in this world under all of my burdens, under everything that I'm going through. Secondly, we see again the psalm teaching his man's full responsibility is to keep our eye on God's word as our instruction. He says, I do your commandments. In other words, Lord, I have made up my mind to conform to you. I'm sorry, to conform to your will in everything. Notice now how these two things go together. We can't hope for God's salvation unless we determine to do his commandments. They go together. So if we're diligently following the word of God, we are going to have the hope of salvation. And because we have that hope, it will keep us busy and it will increase the desire of our heart to do his word. The more real, the more true and genuine that our hope is for the Lord, the more sincere our obedience is going to be to him. Verses 167 through 168. The psalmist says, My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Lord, I have loved your laws. I love them so much. And yes, I obey your commandments. I obey your decrees because, Lord, you're omniscient. You know everything that I do. The psalmist loved God's word exceedingly, very much so. Our love for the word of God must be of the highest quality, the highest kind of love. We must love it better than than wealth. We must love it better than the pleasures of this world. And it has to be a love that conquers all. A love that will overpower and crush our lusts, you know, our our pleasures, and, and, and a love that will totally destroy any and all of our fleshly desires. Also, his soul has kept God's word. His soul has kept God's word. The soul has to be set apart. It has to be renewed and delivered by the word of God. The soul has to stay Busy glorifying God because we're called to worship him in the spirit. We have to keep both of the teachings and the testimonies, which are the, and the, which are the commands of God. We're to keep them by obeying them. And, and we're to keep and, and his promises. We are to keep his teachings and testimonies, uh, his promises by depending upon them. 
You know, the, the psalmist here governed his life. The psalmist ruled his life by a good principle. There in verse 168, he says, I keep your precepts and your testimonies for all my ways are before you. He says, he's saying, Lord, you know, you know every move that I make. You know everything that I do. You know every thought in my head. You know every word before I speak it. You watch everything I say and do very closely. You see and you're pleased with all that I do right. And then you see and you're displeased with everything that I say and do wrong. So knowing that God sees everything. Knowing that God's eye is on us all the time. That should make us very careful in everything that we do to keep his commandments. So if trusting God involves obeying his word, and it does, then there can't be any real relationship if we don't read and study the Bible. We need to do more than, you know, we need to do more than just casually read the Bible or occasionally read the Bible. Reading the Bible has to be the consuming desire of a believer's life. Because you see, it's only by studying God's word that we learn what it means to obey God and to follow Christ. So in closing, if you want to know God as he speaks to you through the Bible, you need to do, some, uh, you need to do a few things. First of all, study the Bible every day. Every day. We need to discipline ourselves. We need to set aside, make a regular time to read and to study. Just like we do to eat and to sleep. The Bible tells us, I think it's John 6. It tells us in several places, but I'm thinking of John 6, that Jesus is the bread of life. He's our spiritual food. You know, just like we, you know, we can, we can have a wonderful meal spread before us on the table. And we can look at it and, how, and we can say how good that looks and we can smell it and say how, how delicious that smells. And, but if we don't eat it, we're not going to receive the enjoyment out of it. We're not going to receive the nourishment from it. And it's the same thing with Jesus Christ. He's the bread of life. He's our spiritual food. But he has to be taken in to feed our spirit. If we don't read the Bible regularly, we're going to grow cold to God and we're going to slack in spiritual things. And not only that, we open ourselves up to temptation and the sin that so easily follows after it. Another thing that we need to do is study the Bible methodically and completely. Don't read it like I said casually. Don't, you know, just picking and choosing anywhere you want. Read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, not just topical. Don't just close your eyes and, and end up Pointing to a certain scripture, go. Well, this is where I'm going to read. But, but, because by doing this, if you by casual reading, you don't read a lot of the Bible. You don't get all that it has to say to you. You have no depth, which you see, unfortunately, in a lot of Christians. You need to try to familiarize yourself with the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, uh, because if you don't, you're going to limit your growth. You're going to limit your growth if you don't read all the books and try to understand them. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is profitable. And as I've said before, it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. Third, if you want to know God as he speaks to you through the Bible, you need to also study the Bible devotionally. When you read the Bible, when you read and study the Bible, we're, we don't do it for head knowledge or don't do it for head knowledge. Then we can get it puffed up and say, oh yeah, I know what the Bible says. You read the Bible, you study the Bible devotionally, you do it to get to know God. To hear his voice and to hear what God says to you, to change you. To change you. To be changed by him as we grow in his grace through the knowledge of the word of God. We need to let, as Paul said, the word of God become a part of us, to dwell in us richly, to find a home in our heart. But in order to do that, we need to memorize as much scripture as we can. 
which is important for spiritual growth. And then lastly, we need to study the Bible prayerfully. You can't study the Bible devotionally without praying. Prayer and the word go together. You find it, you know, coupled together in the scriptures. You can't study the Bible devotionally without praying. Before you start praying, ask God for the Holy Spirit to help you to understand it the way you should. Psalm 119, 18 is another one of my favorite verses, Psalm 119. And it's one that, that I remember and, and it's, it's set in my mind. And every time I open the scriptures, it's my prayer. Lord, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Wondrous things. Those, those deep things of your word, God. Because when we don't regularly study and regularly pray, we're not walking with Jesus as his followers. And we're definitely not obeying him in specific areas. So doing those things just mentioned may be a life, you know, it, to a lot of people it might be just boring. Unfortunately, to many believers. But those who really follow Jesus Christ will experience something different in their life. The Bible promises us that. We go on an adventure with God. And you know what? There's an incredible freedom from, from myself, you know, from, my, from selfishness, and from sin. Jesus told many who believed in him and were listening to him about his teachings that in John 8, 31, 30, he said that if you really are my disciples, notice, you really are my disciples, if, notice the condition, you are really my disciples if you keep obeying my teachings. The inference is you're not. If you don't really uh, keep, my, uh, keep my teachings, keep and obey my teachings. He says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You see, freedom comes when you decide to obey Christ. Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful passage, Lord, and the Psalms here, especially Psalm 119. And God, it's, it's amazing that about this this one psalm, God, is just all about your word, Lord. And it's amazing that this psalm is in the center of the Bible. All about the word of God. Just again, just looking at it and just being the word of God should be the, the center of our lives, God. Lord, you've given us such a, 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 a valuable treasure, Lord. Lord, help us to treat it as such. Help us to love it to take care of it, God, to, to, to absorb ourselves in it, Lord, to saturate ourselves in the Word of God. And we can get to know you. And as we get to know you, we, we grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.